This is not a test Don't expect to be impressed Put on your life vest Sit down your armrest It's turn to stray from the grind Don't take my hand cause you'll find Hi there and welcome to Side Quest, the in-between episodes where we're not adventuring through lands of fantasy and mysticism, we're generally complaining about television, or interviewing people more interesting than us, and today happens to be the latter, so lucky you. Who do we have with us today? Myself, Steve Weverell, Drew Hayes, Robert Bevan, hello the normal guys who are always on this side. Hey, hey. But who isn't a normal guy? Who isn't well, always on the podcast? Our special guest. Eric Uglint, how do you do? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, if anybody hasn't heard of Eric Uglint, it's uh, a prolific name in Lit RPG with the both the Good Guys and Bad Guys series. Speaking of Lit RPG, specifically classified as Game Lit Lit RPG, Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, about what I do, or game lit and lit RPG in general? Uh, I guess we could we could tackle the the entire genre and your place within it. Sure, let's go big. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll do what I can. Uh, so, lit RPG and game lit is a relatively new genre. Kind of depends on who you ask and when it started, but it's kind of agreed to be within the last decade or so. And uh, it came from South Korean and Japanese light novels over through Russia, and then uh, English authors found it, and have been trying to make their own stamp on it ever since. And it's kind of like the uh, the middle ground of, of reading fantasy and playing Dungeons and Dragons. So it's it's more like you're reading Dungeons and Dragons. And usually, if it's lit RPG, the game mechanics are very visible and obvious. And uh, I think to really be applied to this genre you you need as a as a story they need to be integral to it It can't just be sort of like layered on and and not really make a difference to the plot or anything that's happening as far as myself um i think it was 2018 i published the first book in the good guys and i had been writing in a couple of other genres before then and i had no idea about lit rpg and just kind of discovered it, started reading it, and just like realized this really lines up with all the things I like to do. And, uh, you know, I just, I really enjoy telling stories in, in that style and have just kind of gone full in on it ever since. That's, for me, quite a useful explanation of what the RPG is because it does tend to vary. For instance, uh, Bevan's probably the closest writer we have to the RPG. It's kind of a, it's a D&D isekai, I guess. Uh, the mechanics mm-hmm. are sort of integral to the world, but there are different, I guess, variations of how intense someone can go with that. Our listeners have described you as a crunchy lit RPG, which I'm given to mm-hmm. believe okay. is, I guess, more mechanic heavy. Would that be fair to say? I think, so. yeah, I think so. I, I don't think I'm anywhere near as crunchy as, as some other authors because I don't necessarily dwell much in the math. And I feel yeah. like the crunchier authors have much more, you know, these are the formulas and I, you know, this is the way that I can really maximize this formula. If I do just this extra bit of mana into this spell here, then I'm going to get three extra points of damage there. There are layers of crunchiness there. Yeah. I didn't know what crunchy was until Steve explained it to me. Well, I didn't know what crunchy was until one of our listeners explained it. Oh, wait, no. I asked you about it, and I looked up the answer on Google before you could answer. (laughs) That's that's probably better, yeah, to be fair. The only reason I brought it up is I wanted to hear Eric explain it. Yeah, I mean, it's a new genre, and so a lot Mm. of the rules and the tropes are still being established. Yeah, speaking of it being like, it's a relatively new genre. Um, Mm -hmm. I was going to ask... I mean, I guess this would have come up from having a love of both D&D and, I guess, fantasy novels in general, like, say, you were already publishing before this. But given that the the genre is so new, how much did other lit RPG authors influence you? 
Um, a fair amount. So when I first found out about it, there wasn't so much in the genre that you, if you were really trying, you couldn't read the bulk of it. You know, now I think there'd be real, a real challenge. There's a lot of material out there. So I really dug into it and I read as much as I could. So there is a lot of, uh, there's sort of a lot of information out there to, to build off of. You know, and I, I was, uh, I was really impressed with the, with Alaron Kong and the land. You know, when I first read that, I really enjoyed it. I know Matt Denneman's more recent, but he's someone that I've, uh, he's a friend of mine and, and I've often looked at what he's doing and sort of found a lot of interesting bits and pieces there. Oh, we definitely love uh, Matt. He's a good friend of the podcast. He's going to be at our convention this yeah, year. That crazy guy. He's always. He's, I don't know how does how does he write so much and still go to every single convention. I I have no idea. I was just in Denver with him uh, at a convention a couple of weeks ago, and I think he was already at one again last weekend. Yeah, he was at Norwest Con. Yep. Not to be confused with any of the other conventions that happen in the Northwest. <laughs> A suitably vague title, yeah. <laughs> I read just about everything I could get my hands on uh, in those early days, and it was just because I was just trying to understand what the rules were. You know, how how yeah. does this differentiate from fantasy? What what makes this unique? That's interesting. Let's say you being published uh, before your foray into lit RPG. Mm -hmm. I guess what did you find? Was there Anything more liberating about writing in lit RPG, despite the rules? Oh, sure. I mean, so I've always... Fantasy has always been one of my favorite genres to read. But I always felt like I didn't necessarily have the sort of serious chops to go uh, write epic fantasy. But I feel like there is a more pulp mindset to lit RPG. Uh, and there, there's more of a... There's more of a sense of fun. And I think, you know, obviously I'm generalizing broadly here, but th to me, it seemed like there was more room for fun and goofiness and a bit of sass and sarcasm than I saw in Epic Fantasy. And it just resonated with me. I guess that makes sense. I suppose Lit RPG and the idea of Isekai is maybe the only way to, I guess, reclaim a very entrenched genre with kind of very entrenched, I guess, tropes and beloved tropes i suppose maybe it's the only yeah. way to kind of drag it into the modern world yeah i think that that's certainly a way to, to look at it a lot of the uh, other lit rpg authors like to give me a hard time because i've i've been saying that lit rpg isn't a genre so much as a, a style so you because you have to have a genre associated with it it's just there is no just lit rpg the bulk of what we write is fantasy lit rpg but you could do sci-fi lit rpg um i mean carmen cooper does uh he has a Western lit RPG. I know that Tao has tried a romance lit RPG. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can take it. It's just that the most successful people have been so far has been with fantasy. Nobody likes a radical, Eric. You've got a target on your back now. Big one. <laughs> okay, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, again, I, I, I called you a prolific lit rpg writer and i think that might be an understatement because it comes to you've done this unique thing uh with your series where you have two sort of parallel series called the good guys and the bad guys for i guess obvious reasons if you want to explain that well so originally i was writing about someone who wasn't so great and wanted to you know when you get isekai you kind of have a chance at a new life and so he decided to be a good guy instead of a bad guy he was in the previous life. And then I realized I wanted to write something that was a little bit different and provided a little bit of uh, an alternative uh, just to writing the same book, uh, the same series. So I started The Bad Guys, which was about someone who wasn't that bad and going and trying to be bad, but realizing he wasn't just a bad person. So it's more like a Robin Hood tale. And as I was building sort of the grander narrative, I realized that there's a third piece that I've I've had planned that'll be I don't know when it's gonna be coming out just because I just my schedule is so full lately. I was wondering was it gonna be the neutral guys or the ugly guys? But there will be an ugly guys and it will hey. be weaving in. So it'll be three series going on at the same time. Represent I know, we yeah. They're completely a different guys. 
I could write out one. That sounds like an easy one to write. <laughs> I got a, I got a, a deal with Yonder, and they asked if I would write something for their platform, which is like a serial fiction based platform. Oh, cool! And I did the Grim Guys there, which is still happens in the same world, same timeline, but just somewhere different, and focuses on uh, two monster hunters kind of pattern who who decide that they are going to be brothers in this new world that they're in oh nice again you mentioned your schedule there and i mentioned there is a large uh catalog of eric uglin stories for anybody who is curious uh do you sleep (laughs) occasionally but mostly it's because (laughs) of uh, uh of children who wake me up not necessarily being busy working Ah, I see. But I'm nowhere because, near as prolific as a lot of the other authors out there. Yeah, but I'm I'm also, you know, curious to know whether they they are in fact human beings too, because there are some there are some massively prolific. You say like Matt Dinham, how does he find a f- time to to turn up at the cons? I've been to a con with Matt, and he seemed like pretty spaced out. <laughs> like he's got a lot going on. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. You know, there's there there are tricks to it. You know, you can certainly find some shortcuts here and there. Uh, but mm. a lot of it is just being able to type quickly, I suppose. Just type quicker. If you're type quicker, uh, if, I, yeah, yeah. I'm married to my editor, so that kind of helps. Oh so, man, yeah. You know, I'm the only author that she edits, and mm-hmm. she just kind of waits for my books, and I can just get them get them to her when they're done, or when she yells at me enough to get them done. <laughs> just she's, a real she's time the editor. CEO. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Works for me. If we're just talking about the, the good guys and, and the bad guys, what is that? It's a lot. Huh? That's about thirty That's books in the series. Good. Is that right? Oh, yeah, it's a it's a huge amount. Yeah. Uh it's not that many. It's fourteen are out in the good guys so far and nine are out in the bad guys. So that's what, twenty two? Oh yeah, o- only only twenty two books. <laughs> That's most of my whole catalog. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so these all take place in the same world. Now, are all the are all the good guys the same characters, and the bad guys a different set? Yeah. So essentially, so the good guys follows <laughs> a singular character named Montana, who's kind of just. Uh, the biggest hammer looking at a world of nails. Uh, And he's about as smart as a hammer. And it's mainly him forced into a leadership position that he doesn't want and really can't handle. And it's kind of a town building out in the wilds. And then the bad guys is sort of a Robin Hoody uh, thief who is actually in the capital city of the same country. So it's much more urban focused. Um, slinking around stealing things learning some magic on the way um and you're i kind of set it up so you can see some of the the politics happening there that have ramifications for the good guys okay that's what i was going to ask about uh because they were set in different parts of the same world are there uh, i wanted to know if there were like tangential things that that uh affect both oh yeah definitely yeah, there are things that are, there's there are small things and, and there are some some major things. There's not I, I I try to work hard to make sure that if you want to only read one series, then you don't need yes, to read the other one. That's uh that there's nothing that is fundamental that is sort of shown in one series and not the other. Um, so there are some characters characters crossover, but no one no one major. Right. Or if they do, you know, you're you're finding some of the like there's there's nothing hidden in the other books that will disrupt something out. I mean, some of the, like the timelines are shifted so that if you read it in a specific way, some there's little uh, tidbits that you get in one series that'll make the other like you start reading the other series and like, oh, I know who that is. You know, I've heard about them from this other series. Now you're seeing them up close and in personal interactions. And so I have tried to hide a few surprises in that way, but nothing like where you have to read them all. And the Grim Guys is even sort of sure. further afield. It's in the next country over. Um, but it's the, the country that's at war with the main country and the good guys and the bad guys. So trying to like show that they're not just evil people. They're just people whose ruler has a, a different perspective on things and wants to take over the world. 
Excellent. So given that we, we have like a, a few people starting their writing journey who listen to this podcast, mm-hmm. uh, so far some good advice with typing fast and having a living editor. I <laughs> definitely could get behind that. But um, mm-hmm. the scope of what you're doing, how do you plan the world building? Do you have one of those crazy CIA boards with like uh, bits of string and photographs? I keep waiting to see one of those. Please well, tell me you do. Not here because it's a vacation house, but you know, <laughs> yeah, I have I have uh, notebooks and and all sorts of you know crazy stuff like that. You know, so part of it was was building the world before I started building the stories and building the game before I started building the world. So layering things mm-hmm. on top of each other. And then the final bit is really only building as much of it as I need as I'm going so that I'm not spending time building an entire world when I'm only focused on a little bit. Sensible. Oh, yeah. I mean, Cause you can really get lost in world building. You just spend forever trying to build the world if you really want to. And it all, you know, you can all defend it as work as writing because you know, yeah. this could be useful someday. You go full Tolkien. You never come out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, I have a I have a private world anvil that myself and a couple of volunteers work on together. And try to keep it all moving together. And for those of us who maybe should know but don't, uh, what is a world anvil? <laughs> so, world anvil is a program that allows you to. I guess it, it's kind of like the digital version of that CIA board. You know, so it allows oh. you to put things together and like use hyperlinks to tie them all to, together. So you can say, you know, here is this spell that was learned by this character. We'll try to get into screen. So you're saying like this character lives in this city, and then you have so you can click on that, and then you can go yeah, to that Drew. city and see like, okay, here's the story of this his, this city and the country that it's in, and when I wrote about it this one time i mentioned this guy was the mayor and this was the tavern that the character went to and these are the people that were in the tavern and so you can just sort of follow all the those little things through as necessary wow that sounds like an awesome resource that's amazingly useful bevan it's great so <laughs> world anvil is one and then campfire is another they're both sort of competing apps and uh I, you know, I've heard great things about both. I just happen to use World Anvil right now. And I stumbled on these two readers who are maybe the most amazing readers I could have ever found. And they kind of live in my books and they know more about it than I do. And I also have just a Discord uh, message group with just them. And it's, I wouldn't say daily, but it's very often. I'll just send them a note and be like, you know, what color is this person? what color were their eyes or like, what Hmm. was the name? Did I name this ocean? And like, I'll get everything back. I could want authors and dragons. We are uh, a a big proponent of our listeners being far more competent than we are. It's almost integral to our, uh, you know, our brand. You know, it's amazing how, how useful that is. (laughs) It's the only reason I'm successful. Uh, don't tell them that when the royalties come in. Yeah. But, um, (laughs) I get what you're saying. Um, I always want to ask this to a lit RPG person, but the only one I know is Bevan, and he'd give me an answer that would uh, would shock and disappoint me, I'm sure. If you were to be isekai into a and d world, and you could choose the class, type of person, what would you choose? So, as in, like, saying I would want to go to Greyhawk or, uh, oh, God, what was the dark, dark stone? I can't remember the name of Dark Sun. Obviously, I wouldn't want to go there. That'd be horrific. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I kind of would want to go to, is it K- Kier? Dragon, where Dragonlance takes place? Dragonlance I guess, is a nice I think, one. No, if I had to live there, there yeah. if I had to live in this world, I would probably try to be a paladin because, you know, you've got some tanky skills. You could You could make a living just being a healer and taking care of a small village somewhere. And uh, not get involved in the huge wars. You're not going to be. If you're a mage, you get the really cool magic, but you also got to deal with like Raceland and all those things. Oh, I mean, that's man, a really good question. Awesome, I don't man. know, man. <laughs> you don't have to deal with shit. You're a mage. You, that's where the money is. Yeah, but there's a lot of response. Yeah, there's a lot but... of backstabbing going on with the mages, man. They're always up to something. 
See, I'm, right. I, I go Druid, baby. Access to a little bit from every class. Uh, get that wild shape to get out of dodge when shit gets real. Yeah, uh, I think Survivability. That... Druid, Druid's where it's at. I'm changing my answer. Plus, my I'm name's in it. it. Right? I See? was about yeah. to say everyone loves a paladin, but then I remembered I'm on Authors and Dragons, and that is not, <laughs> not the case on our podcast. Hey, I Quite decided the, the, the next D&D game campaign I join. I am going to play the traditional 1980s, 1990s style chaotic good paladin. I guess lawful good paladin. I'm just going to lean yeah, into it. I think it had to be uh, lawful in that day and age, man. That oh, yep. Back in the alignment restrictions. Yep, and I'll see if I Don't can find those. someone to play a, a half-elf uh, ranger rogue multi-class. <laughs> That's kind of a fun idea. Just the most stereotypical uh, characters you can possibly build. Full generic. Exactly. That is it. Full generic, and just lean into it. And maybe yeah. you know, you, if you have the the right sort of a DM, you can just have them just always. They're rolling into towns, and the townspeople are just like, "What you, did you guys fall out of a bad story? Like, who is this group?" <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, you've got a half orc barbarian. Got a chaotic, <laughs> good rogue. Yeah, you're, you're oh, chasing down a the... shadowy villain. Hey, Paladin, is your dad missing or presumed dead without a body? <laughs> yeah, he's your dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it's a surly wizard who can't get uh, can't get any social interactions going. I thought you were going to say can't get an erection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wizard with ED. That's I mean, pretty. That's... It's implied, right? <laughs> So that's all I took away from Dragonlance. You have to have the really beautiful cleric to do lay on hands, right? <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't have to be that good looking. I think we've gone we've gone away from we've gone away from generic to slightly erotic, which is <laughs> also generic. I don't say it is it, yeah. Also kind of inevitable, I suppose. Yeah. You mean a homely peasant could lay on hands and... <laughs> Yeah, that could be going. Well the right kind of and now we all know why Raceland was so angry all the time. God, right. that series makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, it was one of my favorites growing up. I love that. Um, I think I probably would try to live in that one. I mean, it'd be, you know, we know the most about the Forgotten Realms just because they've that's all they've been writing about lately. But <laughs> ironically titled, then I suppose. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, it's the one we know the most about. Yeah. What was the one with the magic trains? Even magic trains. Oh, yeah. Polar Express. Oh, you know, yeah, you know, I'd go live in the Polar Express. That'd be great. They could use a pallet in there. God, no, that would be terrifying. <laughs> that would be terrifying. <laughs> Occasionally, Tom yeah. Hanks comes out and yeah. harasses you about hot Molested chocolate. Molested by dead-eyed Tom yeah. Hanks. Yeah. Stay away from my children, Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the good old days. The D&D world of Polar Express. <laughs> And the shadowy oh villain, dead-eyed Tom Hanks. What I love about the internet is that it's probably already out there somewhere. Someone's definitely going to be soon. Yeah, it will be soon. What is the D and D equivalent of Rule Thirty Four? It's got to be one, right? Anyway, let's it's rule thirty-four. Still rule thirty-four. It's still oh, rule thirty-four. <laughs> okay, so deep into the series, good guys, bad guys, and the corresponding tales within that. Mm-hmm. How? far do you see yourself taking this story given that you've put so much into i guess keeping the world building sound and you've got such a strong foundation how far do you think you can go with this i mean so in this particular storyline i guess storylines i do have there is a greater tale progressing um i don't really have a book number in mind but I have a vague concept of, of where I'm at. And I think I'm sort of at the one third ish mark sort of depends on how many sort of side quests I decide to get distracted by along the way, or how focused I get on just like ripping through to the end. But yeah, I have, uh, you know, a great big story that's happening so far, mainly in the background, just sort of like little tidbits and, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't really know if there's a numerical way to describe it or how much I can say without giving too much away. Yeah. We're not expecting any, uh, 
you know, radical spoilers on this podcast. But if you have any, you know, please do. So let me think. <laughs> and I suppose the advantage of, um, I guess, building up the world like this, I mean, I suppose even once the main events play out and the characters play out, you still have that world in, in a very kind of Raymond E. Feist kind of way. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of the problem with writing something like this is is sort of author burnout, trying to make sure that creatively I'm not just sunk into just the same story for so long that I get that I get tired of it, um, mm. let alone if other people do. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of a lot of room to explore that I've, I've tried to make it uh, as open a re- and a real world as possible. So if I do want to lean into what Travis Baldry has built the uh, the fantasy cozy, then, you know, I'm pretty sure I could find a, a small corner of the world to write about a goblin starting a gelato stand. <laughs> Something a along goblin those lines. gelato stand. That's a... Uh... That's that's got to write itself, right? I think um, goblins and gelato. I don't want I don't want to make promises on your half on your behalf, but I'm looking forward to that coming out, Eric. <laughs> you heard it here first. Goblins surely and is the goblato chronicles. <laughs> the goblato chronicles. Surely, as soon as you said that, you were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's gonna happen." <laughs> um, a friend and I are already writing it, so don't worry about it. It's, Excellent. It's in the works. Goblin, but now Goblato. I mean, yeah, Goblato <laughs> has to be in there somehow. The yeah, goblin, I don't Goblin know. putting out. <laughs> I mean, I love goblins. They're one of my favorite creatures. Goblins and kobolds. I, I do the love a goblin. Yeah, there's a lot you can do with them. Oh yeah. Well, just yeah, trying to to toe the line between the uh, established creatures and coming up with all my own stuff is is a bit of a challenge lately. I really do need to put together another CAA board on the monsters just to try to keep them all straight. That was one thing I did appreciate about uh, the World of Warcraft goblins. Just giving um, goblins Boston accents. Fantastic move. <laughs> so I don't know why I didn't see it before <laughs> while I was reading like Lord of the Rings. Just like, I'm tempted to reread it now. And... Uh, It'll just make more sense to me if they all sound like they've come out of Goodfellas. As soon as it is uh, in in the public domain, I'm going to hire just a group of Southie actors. Just have them <laughs> redo all of them. Okay, so other than uh, uh, Goblin Ice Cream, other than this uh, entrenched world you are building... Are you still writing outside of Lit RPG, or is this just no turning back for you now? Um, I have a, a secret project I'm not allowed to talk about that is not fantasy Lit RPG. Um, but mostly, yeah, mostly all in on Lit RPG. I don't. I mm. spend more time thinking about other things I could write that are just not fantasy Lit RPG, but are other stories with lit RPG style style elements. Yeah. Um, I spent like the last eight months, nine months, just fiddling with this story that I can't figure out. That is uh, kind of like a roguelite that is set in the 1980s. Sounds fun. Yeah. It's like quantum leap style. So, you know, this person jumps into a, a new body, but then it's mixed with groundhog day. And so every time they die, they're in the same body starting at the moment they le- leapt into it for lack of a better way of describing it. And then they have to like, you know, make the perfect run in order to, to keep the world from ending. And then as soon as they do, they're like whisked off to the next body. That sounds really cool. Actually. I haven't been able to, I, one, I don't have the time to write in. Uh, so my wife says I'm not allowed. And two, uh, I just can't, I can't get the story to work yet. He'll hear you. I do like the fact that the eighties has become this, such an exaggerated recollection of the era that it is almost like a fantasy world in itself. Oh yeah. Well, and there's just so much pop culture to, to lay on top of there. Hmm. It's, it's easy to use some of those things as a shorthand because we're all familiar with, you know, if I start talking of, you know, the town looks like Hill Valley or, 
you know, it's the messy bedroom of, of Michael J. Fox at the start of that, of back to the mm-hmm. future. It's like, you already know exactly what I've, exactly what it looks like. And, and kind of, you probably are already guessing what his family life is just based on the fact that it's a similar setup. Yeah. I guess eighties is kind of a genre now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to admit, I am curious about, uh, Lit's RPG again, uh, Bevan is perhaps the writer I've known for the longest on this podcast. And even though he was using the whole mechanic of, well, of mechanics uh, back then, I never really can. Cons- I was writing this for five years before I knew Lit RPG <laughs> was a thing. <laughs> I don't think it had a name at the time. <laughs> I remember somebody yeah, I mean- des- describing it as a Dungeons and Dragons parody, and I thought that's well, that's correct, but. <laughs> you know, we didn't we didn't really have the terminology back then, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there are a number of books you can look back to and say, oh yeah, this this would have been lit RPG had had that classification been there back then. Hmm. Yeah, I'm genuinely curious to know if again I write a lot of kind of parody of the fantasy genre, and having those mm-hmm. you know having those accessible tropes available whenever I want them. And knowing that whoever's reading it will understand it is a very useful storytelling crutch is the wrong word, but I guess like um device. Yeah, device. Device is a much kinder mm-hmm. word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I'm wondering part of me always thought that including game mechanics might be restrictive, but the more I read of the genre and the more I've heard the genre, I wonder if it opens up in fact more opportunities for connecting with with readers who are just as familiar with, I guess, the gaming side of fantasy as they are with the literature side of fantasy. I mean, I would argue that that I would always say that having more restrictions gives you a greater avenue towards creativity. That just complete and utter freedom is where you can kind of get bogged down and you just don't know what direction to take things. And you, a lot of the readers who are getting into lit RPG are not necessarily readers before they find lit RPG. You know, there's a lot of people who think of themselves as gamers who are not necessarily finding the time in their lives to be able to play games and, and scratch that itch, but find that lit RPG allows them to do that. There's a lot of, you know, truckers who listen to lit RPG. I mean, I mm-hmm. think that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily see it as, as bridging the, the gap of fantasy readers finding game game tropes there to help them so much as finding people who might not necessarily be readers who are gamers who suddenly can connect to a story because of those elements and they you know because they understand it and they start to see hmm. or you know, want to see the progression yeah oh that's interesting i'd actually never thought about it like that i came to D D way after um reading stuff like dragonlance and mm-hmm. uh, the Rift War stuff, even though all that, I guess, spawned from playing D and D. So uh, no, it never occurred to me to look at it like that, but that makes a lot of sense here. Yeah. Well, there's also people who are coming into lit RPG from video games, especially. You know, mm. there's a lot of people who who are playing Skyrim and and get to the end of that story, but still want to have that that sort of experience of seeing that world or seeing a different world. Um, but come at it from the, the point of view of the RPG mechanics that they've learned from playing RPG video games. Hmm. And I suppose the mechanics of RPG video games, there's a very straight line between those and early tabletop RPG. Yeah. I would say it's just more like a shaded spectrum. Hmm. That it's, you know, that's obviously where the ideas came from. And then a lot of the times they just get shifted around in very slight ways until you can't really tell the difference, but you know, you, it's, it's there. Yeah. I always prefer it, um, with as little math as possible. So <laughs> I do appreciate yeah, the I like, games making that more accessible to people like me who hate math. Exactly. I want the computer to do the work for me. Yeah. That's what they're for. Uh, yeah. AI back off, do the math, <laughs> leave the fun stuff to the rest of us. But that's a that's a yeah. separate podcast. <laughs> yeah, AI is fascinating. I am I'm loving it. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Okay, why are you loving it? Is it because you want the machines to destroy us, Eric? Is that the bomb you're about to drop? 
I never want to say anything that our forthcoming robot overlords <laughs> might take in any negative way because I love Sensible. that. Sensible, yeah. Wholehearted. Smart call. You know, in looking at a lot of... I have long used name generators and sort of, you know, the things that you can find on... What is it? Don John? All sorts of the various, like, uh, you know, medieval tavern generator or a lot of the tools for... for that people have built for DMs, random tables and stuff. And in a certain way, that's what I have have started to use like chat GPT for. I use it as a as a as a writing assistant where I'm asking mm-hmm. it sort of the questions that I don't want to try to figure out how to search for. You know, the other day I needed to name a guard captain. I was like, okay, well just asked chat DPT what the, the last captain of the guards for Sar Nicholas was. It's like, great, I'll use that name. And anyone who reads it and knows who that person historically is gets that little dopamine hit of, oh, that's neat. But for me, like that would have actually taken time for me to research and find out, whereas it was literally mm-hmm. just typing it in for that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of promise. Um, I've done a few experiments with some um, apps you know, one of which with with the developer of, of the AI, just so they could watch how I was using it. And it's it's really interesting how it's working right now. And the way that I would describe it is is you think of it like the AI is your kitchen staff in a restaurant. You know, it can't build the menu, it can't figure out what to make. It can't provide any of the ingredients, but it can do like the mise en place and it can do kind of make some of the sauces and it can kind of say, oh, this this could taste good with that thing. But ultimately, you still need, you know, the chef to do all the guidance and make sure everything is done correctly at the end. So Mm. for me, it's really cool to to have access to a writing assistant who I can ask all sorts of banal, dumb questions to. Yeah, but I'm also not using it to try to you know generate stories or or provide kind of that level no. of assistance. No, while I'm sure various charlatans are, I do agree with you. It does seem like as a I guess a research assistant, uh, AI is a, is a pretty good buddy. Um, they can kind of like it can sort of surprise you. And cut out hours of uh, Wikipedia rabbit holing, which uh, right. I, can be a time sink. I do have some some decently you bad do ADHD. That because you want so. to <laughs> waste time yeah, so because I, you want to. I know. <laughs> if I if I get stuck into one of those, I was like, I went to go look up the type of wood used in a ship, and like five hours later, I'm coming out of the hole having figured out why the p-38 lightning was the most effective fighter in the pacific but not the european theater <laughs> that's the thing it's an enriching experience but probably not in the direction you want to be enriched yeah i have so much worthless information now. yeah yeah there's all these points in stats you did not intend to build i think that made you sound smart <laughs> <Not worthless at all. laughs> there we go continue my research into flight characteristics World War II fighter planes. Well, you never know when that's going to come in handy. That's right. I could write the uh, World War II literature RPG. Yeah, there you go. Well, well uh, Bevan, I apologize. <laughs> I did see someone working out the math the other day of how well an F-16 would go up against an adult red dragon. And the dragon just has no chance. Yeah. That's a great thing about modern humans. We do tend to kill dreams really efficiently. Yeah. If there was magic in the world, you can be sure we'd find a way to boil it down and put it in a needle. Yeah. Or pack it at the end of a warhead. Yeah. Yep. Oh my god. Or both. That's right. That'd probably be the most depressing lit RPG. Or I guess reverse lit RPG. <laughs> yeah. I am become deaf destroyer of fantasy worlds. Yeah. It makes sense. Just send atomic bombs through various portals. <laughs> oh, it takes all the joy out of it. I try. Okay, speak. <laughs> we were speaking of uh, con experiences and, and Matt Dinneman never sleeping. 
what do you have planned mm-hmm. for the year? Do you make a lot of appearances? I don't. I don't really make any appearances. I uh, no. stay in my little hole in Maine for the most part, except you know visiting cloudy LA for a week. Um, I was trying to get to Dragon Con this year, and I just couldn't make the dates work. Just had a, a baby last summer, so she's still young enough that you know being away for a week is a bit of a challenge. Um, of course, yeah. So I don't really congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, she's nine months old and somehow weighs twenty five pounds, which is absolutely absurd for the size of a child. But <laughs> she's great, uh, and I will continue to blame her for my lack of productivity. Excellent. Uh, I have mainly it's just writing. I have good guys coming out soon. Then I'm going to be putting bad guys out. Um, hopefully in early June, maybe late June, July, August, September, sometime around then. Um, and then I'm writing a new series for Atheon, which I've been describing as a, a fuzzy puppet tower climber. <laughs> could be a genre you you could have just taken like the wrong I'm, pill. I'm starting it <laughs> i'm mean, sure i did that too it's about a uh a, a human who's isekai into the body of a of, of fuzzy puppet a wizard is is trying to bring life into inanimate objects and every time he does the inanimate object is so you know the, the human inside the inanimate object is so stunned they don't really know how to react to the what seems to them giant wizard who's trying to talk to them. The wizard keeps thinking he's failing and throws everything down the uh, trash chute, which he's been throwing magical experiments down for the last few hundred years. And it has created this, these floors of arcane refuse. And uh, yeah, this uh, poor fuzzy puppet has to try to make his way back up to the, the top of the tower to see the wizard to try to get back home. Finally, we have a workable mechanic for understanding the Jim Henson universe. I was thinking the origin of Sloppy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And it was a wizard's ghost. I'm not familiar with Sloppy. You shouldn't be familiar with Sloppy. It's a, it's a t- tangent we don't want to go on right now. <laughs> that, sounds, yeah. that sounds fascinating, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've always been a Jim Henson fan. It was, uh, my earliest goal in life was to be a Muppeteer. And uh, oh, wow. this is kind of going into that direction without, uh, hopefully without invoking too many trademark disputes. Yeah. I think being a Muppeteer is probably the astronaut of mm-hmm. uh, the creative world. Yeah. It has to be the show, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I would have loved, you know, and all the things like, you know, Labyrinth and Dark Crystal and, and those sorts of things were the things that I love the most, even more than the Muppet show. But yeah, the Mupp- being, I mean, being able to, even just being able to actually meet a Muppet and a Muppeteer is now kind of like my high point in life. Someday it's going to happen. I just have to get famous enough. One excellent ambition. A noble ambition, I would say. <laughs> the noble <All> right. quest. <laughs> a noble quest. <laughs> uh, Eric's been an absolute delight talking to you. And, um, it's been lovely. If you're listening to this and you're not curious about the... Uh, the game lit lit RPG series, the good guys, the bad book guys, uh, then you have no soul. Go check out immediately if you haven't done so already. And uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be following the rest of your career, hopefully Muppet oriented career with interest. Thank you so much well, for coming you. on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute delight. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I am super excited about that Muppet book. <laughs> yeah, that's <sounds> brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, and speaking of con appearances, don't forget to uh, book your tickets for Authors and Dragons Con, August 11th to 13th, with the usual Authors and Dragons madness, but with special guests such as Matt Dinneman and Actus and more. So uh, go to www.authorsanddragons.com to buy your ticket there, or to just hang out. I don't know what you do with your free time. I'm not your boss. Again, Eric, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time on SideQuest. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, friends.
Authors and Dragons is brought to you under a Creative Commons license, meaning you are free to share this material so long as credit is given to those who created it, which is us, the people you just heard play the game. Opening and closing themes performed by the Gore Core 4. Authors and Dragons!